Is Mormonism completely made up? How can we prove it's fake? Is it possible? What is the CES letter? I've talked about something called the CES letter on my podcast before, but I haven't done it justice on my main channel before. So let's take a look at the CES letter and look at the proof that Mormonism is fabricated. Let's get into it. First, let's talk about what the CES letter is. It's a letter that was written to the Mormon church by a man named Jeremy Runnels. It's really long. Like, now I think it's up to 114 pages or something. And it was just a list of damning questions that this ex-Mormon sent to the Mormon church. I mean, these questions completely debunk Mormonism. You have to go through some serious mental gymnastics to get around the questions. Now, the CES letter is available for download online, but I believe in supporting artists if possible, and this dude is an artist. I mean, the amount of research he put into this is ridiculous. So if you're interested, you can go buy a copy on Amazon. It's split up into different sections. We've got a section specifically dedicated to errors in the Book of Mormon, problems with the translations, the first vision, the Book of Abraham, polygamy, prophets, testimony and spiritual witness, temples and Freemasonry, science, and others. It's a very comprehensive book. Okay, let's take a look at a few questions from the CES letter and discuss. Here's probably my favorite question from the entire thing. It's the very first question under the Book of Mormon section. Number one, what are 1769 King James Version edition errors doing in the Book of Mormon? A purported ancient text. Errors which are unique to the 1769 edition that Joseph Smith owned. The letter goes on to detail the exact errors that he's talking about. I really can't do it justice. You guys should get a copy of this and read it for yourself. But he cites multiple examples of it. Here's the short version. When the King King James Version was being written in the early 1600s, sometimes they'd insert words to make it easier to understand. He points out in the CES letter that we know which words are because they're italicized in the King James Bible. But the Book of Mormon was supposed to be an ancient book, completely independent of the King James Version of the Bible. The gold plates that Joseph Smith quote-unquote translated were supposedly written between 600 BCE and 421 CE. That's long before 1604 when the translation of the King James Bible started. Why are there known errors from the King James Bible found in the Book of Mormon? Okay, let's take a look at the next question. I'm not going in order, I'm just picking out some of my favorites. Number two, DNA analysis has concluded that Native Americans do not originate from the Middle East or from the Israelites, but rather from Asia. Why did the church change the following section in the introduction page in the 2006 edition of the Book of Mormon shortly after the DNA results were released? They took a passage that says the Lamanites, and they are the principal ancestors of the American Indians, and they changed it to say the Lamanites, and they are among the ancestors of American Indians. By changing that passage, it's basically a subtle acknowledgement that there was an error in the claims of the Book of Mormon. It claimed that Native Americans were descended from ancient Israelites. There was no way to disprove that at the time, back in the 1830s, when this was written, because we didn't know anything about DNA. But we do now. Now, we can unequivocally prove claims made in the Book of Mormon as wrong. And this isn't the only claim by the Book of Mormon that's proven wrong by science. There's a whole science section. So let's skip to the science section and take a look at some of those questions. Number three, if Adam and Eve were the first humans, how do we explain the dozen or so other hominid species who lived and died 35,000 to 2.4 million years before Adam? When did those guys stop being human? That's similar to a question I asked of Jehovah's Witnesses in my last video. Though this isn't really just about Mormonism. It's more a criticism of young earth creationism more generally. And young earth creationists do have answers for this stuff. Their answer is, believe the Bible over anything else, even your own observation, which is an awful way to live your life. If you can independently verify that something is false, then believing it just because some book says it's true is not a good way to get to truth. A little further down on the page, he lists some other things that have been discredited by science, including, but not limited to, the Tower of Babel, which is integral to the Mormon church, a global flood, and Noah's Ark. One of my biggest problems with the whole Noah's Ark situation, and even the Adam and Eve story, is the fact that you can't populate the earth with just two people in Adam and Eve's case. You can't do it with just eight people either in Noah's case. Out of curiosity, I looked this up. How many people would it take to repopulate the Earth? Or how many people would we want to send to Mars if we want to populate the place? For humans, it basically works off of a rule of fives. It could be possible, maybe, 
with just 50 people. Everybody would have to have as many children as possible with everybody else, so monogamy would not be possible. There would have to be breeding councils to try to maximize genetic diversity. Because if you mate with somebody who's too genetically similar to you, then there will be birth defects. And that's why it's absolutely impossible for Cain to have taken his sister as his wife. I don't care about the moral implications of it, so much as I care about the fact that it just wouldn't have worked. I mean, the moral implications are bad enough, but you just can't populate the Earth with your sister. It's literally impossible. Now, at 500 people, monogamy still wouldn't be possible. There would still need to be breeding councils, but it's a little more doable at that point. And at 5,000 people, monogamy would be possible, but polygamy would be preferred. Breeding councils probably wouldn't be necessary. It's more of a rule of thumb than a hard and fast rule, but I can promise you that it's not possible to repopulate the Earth with eight people, and certainly not two siblings. Okay, before we move on to number four, I have to give you a little background in the Book of Abraham. The story goes, a traveling salesman came across Joseph Smith's house selling some old Egyptian hieroglyphics on papyrus, and he got everybody in the church to gather their money together to buy them. So he bought the ancient Egyptian papyrus, and then he proceeded to quote-unquote translate it. He claimed it was another holy book, called the Book of Abraham. Remember, this was hieroglyphics. It was pretty much a set of pictures used to communicate a message. So Joseph Smith copied some of the pictures down that he saw, and he told this story about what it said. The Book of Abraham talks about Abraham's life, including but not limited to his travels to Canaan and Egypt, a vision he had, and some other stuff. So if we get the originals that Joseph Smith purported to quote-unquote translate, then we'd be able to verify one way or another if Joseph Smith really did have something special there, right? We have Egyptologists around today that could actually translate that stuff for realsies instead of for pretensies, and we could finally put this issue to rest, proving if Joseph Joseph Smith was telling the truth and really did find an additional book of the Bible. So what happened to the texts? Well, after Joseph Smith quote-unquote translated it and copied some of the hieroglyphics down, he donated them to a museum, which then burned down. They were lost forever. Except we found the exact hieroglyphics in storage in another museum years later. Turns out they didn't burn with the rest of the stuff in that museum fire. How do we know it's the same stuff that Joseph Smith was reading from? Because we matched up the hieroglyphics that he copied down with the ones we found on the papyrus. The Mormon church has confirmed that they're the original text that Joseph Smith used to quote-unquote translate the book of Abraham. So now we can actually examine the texts and figure out if he was accurate. Now that we've gone through that little history, let's read the question from the CES letter. Number four, Egyptologists have translated the source material for the Book of Abraham and have found it to be nothing more than a common pagan Egyptian funerary text for a deceased man named Hor around the first century CE. In other words, it was a common breathing permit that the Egyptians buried with their dead. It has nothing to do with Abraham or anything Joseph Smith claimed in his translation for the Book of Abraham. How do you square that with your beliefs. Like I said, the LDS Church has confirmed that they are, in fact, the same texts that Joseph Smith used. So how do they square that with their beliefs? Well, they give an answer to this question. Here's their answer. When Joseph Smith used the word translate, what he actually meant was interpret. Maybe the text didn't say what he said they did, but God gave him a message through those texts, even if it isn't at all what it was saying. So Joseph Smith was reading a common funerary breathing permit, but God was providing a full-blown story through those hieroglyphics. So it would be like me reading a Dora the Explorer book in Spanish, even though I can't read Spanish, and claiming that it was a message given to me by God, claiming that God was naming me as his prophet and that the book told a story about ancient Israel. But then when somebody else reads it, they see that it's just Adora the Explorer book. The whole situation is almost comically transparent, and the fact that the leadership thinks they can push this twisted up interpretation of events and not lose people is comical too. Here's another from the Book of Abraham section. Number five. The Book of Abraham teaches an incorrect Newtonian view of the universe. These Newtonian astronomical concepts, mechanics, and models of the universe have since been succeeded and substantially modified by the 20th century Einsteinian physics. What we find in the Book of Abraham and the official scriptures of the LDS Church regarding science reflect a Newtonian world concept. Just as the Catholic Church's Ptolemaic cosmology was displaced by the Copernican and Newtonian world model, however, the 19th century canonized Newtonian worldview 
has since been displaced by Einstein's 20th century science. See, people basing their beliefs off of the Bible have been justifying the Bible's scientific inaccuracies for centuries. It's a product of its time, or they were communicating a message they couldn't understand the best way they could. The problem with the Book of Abraham is the fact that it was based on flawed knowledge from the time. They make claims that would only make sense if the world worked the way they thought it worked at the time. There's really no way to twist it around and make it make sense from another perspective. If God was trying to communicate this message, then he should have been able to reveal the facts about reality, instead of revealing information that was completely based off of what society understood at the time. Aside from that, why are there other ancient biblical texts written from a first century perspective where it never once mentions Newtonian physics or anything like it? But this ancient text, supposedly written around the same time frame, does talk about things from a Newtonian perspective. I really think that the reason Mormonism has so many members is because they don't know about the CES letter. Okay, let's take a look at one last question. This is coming straight from the CES letter. Quote, Joseph Smith used the same magic device, or Ouija board, that he used during his treasure hunting days. He put a rock, called a peep stone, in his hat and put his face in the hat to tell his customers the location of buried treasure on their property. He also used the same method for translating the Book of Mormon. While the gold plates were covered, placed in another room, or even buried in the woods, the gold plates were were not used for the Book of Mormon we have today. And the Mormon church admits that now. This one is really damning. As the question mentions, Joseph Smith famously used to do treasure hunting stuff where he would take money from people to find buried treasure, and they'd come back to him later and tell him that he found the treasure, but there was a hex on it. If they tried to dig for it, it would sink deeper into the ground, and it was lost forever. Then he'd keep their money. But he used the exact same method for the treasure hunting stuff, sticking his face in a hat with a stone in it, both to find the buried treasure and to quote unquote translate the Book of Mormon. He was an obvious fraud, and as far as I'm concerned, this one wraps it up for me. They say you just have to have faith. Well, I'm sorry, I just don't. I don't believe without evidence. In fact, there's actually evidence to the contrary in this case. Why would I believe something that's against all evidence? It really does not add up. Okay, that's all I've got for you. Tell me what you guys think. Which of these was the most damning for Mormonism? Which of these six list items seals it for you? Let me know in the comments. I honestly think the first one is the most damning for me. Why are there King James Version errors in the Book of Mormon? Seriously, it doesn't make any sense at all. Anyways, if you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, then don't forget to check out my Patreon. YouTube is very up and down and completely unreliable. It's very stressful, worrying if I'll be able to pay rent every month or not. So if you want to support me, you can do it through Patreon. You can also support me by checking out my products on Teespring. I have a bunch of cool shirts and mugs and whatnots. In fact, I have some Mormon stuff on there, like this. Mormons perform the best hat tricks, which is a reference to the fact that Joseph Smith would stick his face in his hat to do his quote-unquote translations of the Book of Mormon. And my other Mormon product says, if you can read this, your treasure was hexed. That's a reference to the treasure hunting scam Joseph Smith used to run. Anyways, take a look. That stuff comes in shirt, mug, and sticker form. And lots of others, hoodies and everything. Also, don't forget to check out my podcast and my Facebook. Sometimes I upload videos early on Facebook, so if you want an early sneak peek at them, you can either support me on Patreon or check me out on Facebook. I haven't been uploading early to Facebook lately because views have been down, but I'll get back to it soon. And finally, check out my podcast. I talk about all kinds of interesting stuff on there. So if you want to hear me talk about news stories, then give it a listen. It's on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, and all other podcasting apps. All links are in the description as always. Okay, thanks for watching guys.